Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second keynote of our uh, Migrant Belongings Conference. I hope you have enjoyed the first parallel sessions opening the second day. And uh, I will be, I'm Amanda Alincar. I will be uh, sharing uh, the, the second keynote. Uh, and I would like to uh, first present Larissa Hjorf, uh, who is a distinguished professor. She is a socially engaged artist, digital ethnographer, and director of the Design and Creative Practice Platform at our MIT University, Melbourne. With two decades of research on the gender and social cultural aspects of mobile media and gaming culture in the Asia Pacific, Hjorth has led several projects adopting innovative mobile methodologies to better understand intergenerational relations and explore everyday experiences of care and intimacy in family relations. Her research projects also focus on how digitally mediated practices intersect with the building of intergenerational informal care dynamics in different localities, such as Japan, Australia, South Korea, and China. Larissa Hjorth has an impressive track record of publications on these topics. She has published various books, including Mobile Media in the Asia Pacific, Games and Gaming, Screen Ecologies, to name a few. She has also co-edited the Rutledge Companion to Digital Ethnography, the Rutledge Handbook to New Media in Asia, the Rutledge Companion to Mobile Media, and the list goes on. Hjorth is currently the main, the main investigator of two grants from the Australian Research Council on projects involving research, uh, uh, mobile media practices in Australian, Chinese, and Japanese households, as well as in Australian everyday life. Larissa Hjorth is also a member of leading research centers such as the Australia Center for Excellence for Creative Industries and Innovation, the Young and Well Cooperative Research Center, among others. Hjort's uh, keynote title, Digital Kinship, Understanding Familial Care at a Distance, will give very interesting and unique insights into digital practices of care and the role of everyday forms of intergenerational digital literacies and family transnational relations. Um, Larissa, we are very much looking forward to your keynote. Thank you very much. The screen is all yours. Thank you, Amanda. And um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's evening here, so I'm just giving you a kind of sense of some of the um, different rhythms that are happening at this digital moment. But it's really wonderful to be here, and I feel very honoured to um, be invited. And I thank Sandra and all the people that have been involved in the conference, because a conference of this nature takes a whole family, um, a whole village to, um, to do. So I'd like to thank all those people that are behind the scenes working very hard. Um, as an Australian, I'd also like to say that I'm, um, I'm speaking on unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people, and um, I would like to acknowledge their ancestors, past, present and emerging. Okay, so um, this, this talk is really going to be referencing um, some older projects, but bringing in some newer projects that I have done during the pandemic, which have really amplified um, a lot of the kind of features of digital kingship. Okay, so during the pandemic, the digital recalibrated many aspects of our lives, work, health, sociality, to name a few. Many people had to pivot, and I think a lot of people are a bit sick of the word of pivot, but I'm using it here quite a lot. However, some couldn't. During this time, the correlation between the digital, social inclusion and equality was magnified. This, I pose, means understanding the relationship between the digital, mundane care at a distance and kingship has never been more significant. Digital kingship is a complex nuanced concept that coalesces the increasingly overlapping digital, social and material worlds. 
So in this title, of course, I'm riffing off and repurposing the um, Dutch anthropologist and, and science and technologies uh, scholar, Jeanette Poles and her concept of care at a distance. When, while Poles concept of um, care at a distance was used in the context of telehealth for palliative care at home, we can find multiple forms of mundane care at a distance constantly being operating in and around the home. As the pandemic has highlighted, we do need more robust language to articulate the ways in which the digital is interwoven with these practices of informal care. Informal care not only involves social inclusion, but also invisible forms of supporting well-being that is crucial to us sustain, sustainably aging in place, that is at home. We need to take seriously the often tacit forms of care in and through data as central in shaping contemporary forms of kingship, family and intimacy. Oops, let me just mix. So in this talk, I'm gonna reflect upon a few different projects and some vignettes from um, ethnographic fieldwork to pose some questions and reflections around intergenerational informal care and its relationship to digital media practices especially when distance is involved. In particular, given the issues raised by the pandemic in terms of older adults, I will draw on quite a few collaborative projects. So firstly is the Locating the Mobile project, number one, which was a four year, which ended up being five years <laughs> stretched out, um, Australian Research Council linkage with Intel. And it was exploring digital media in families and households in Tokyo, Melbourne and Shanghai. The other two projects are two uh, projects that were done specifically during the pandemic to really explore some of the um, issues that were being amplified um, during that time. So Alone Together, which was led by Ruth De Silva, was about understanding the experiences of older and culturally and linguistically diverse community backgrounds during the pandemic. And the third one, um, Shaping Connections, is a Australian, um, uh, sorry, I just have to look at my um, slide, um, is the um, Australian Communications Consumer Action Network or ACAN grant. And we worked with the U3A, um, which is the University of Third Age. And this was led by Bernardo Figueiredo. Um, and this project deployed mixed methods approach. So 100, 1,000 surveys and 40 interviews to investigate older adults perceptions of risk around digital media as barriers for social inclusion. So like the second project alone together, um, we, um, Ruth then commissioned and collaborated with um, the artist Sadfir Ahmed to create some powerful illustrations, um, which I'll show during the talk, um, which were about trying to communicate some of these stories in powerful ways for the general public. And this is something that I'll be kind of talking about in the talk as well, is the role of creative practice to kind of um, further amplify our research findings in ways that can enact social change. With the Shaping Connections projects, um, they, uh, have deployed um, digital storytelling, so um, video vignettes, to convey some of those lived experiences for public um, engagement. So as we have witnessed, the pandemic has heightened the role of the digital across all aspects of our lives. And in doing so, as I've said, it's amplified the inequalities and uneven literacies. There is so much to be learned from the pandemic in terms of future scenarios for health, work and society. And at the core of this understanding is taking care seriously as a, as a conceptual framework, as an everyday practice and as an ethics of being in the world. Understanding the role of the digital for care, especially through intergenerational lens is crucial. So in this talk, I'm gonna talk about three key concepts of digital kinship. The first one being mundane forms of care at a distance. The second one being as intergenerational care. And the third being as situating careful surveillance. 
And in particular, I'm going to be focusing and reflecting on older adults' experience and the kind of unevenness of digital literacy and its connection with social inclusion and how we might learn from these existing digital kingship methods. When we first met the Harper family over five years ago, the digital played an important role in strengthening familiar bonds, not just between the human members of the family. For the Harper family, Anne, husband Steve, and teenage daughter Melissa, more than humans such as the cat Zephyr, played a really important defining role. From the outset, when we were going into this project, we thought we would be studying humans and media and thus we deploy the kind of toolkit or kind of ethnographic methods in the home, like interviews and participant observations, scenarios of use and media enactments. However, like all ethnographers, we are constantly pivoting to the field. The field constantly is teaching us and adapting our methods. For me, doing ethnography isn't just a method but rather it's a conceptual lens that takes seriously the role of practice and ritual in how we make sense of the world. As many have experienced during the pandemic, when our everyday rituals are disrupted, we can really struggle with meaning and sense-making. And so it's through these mundane stories and sharing these, you know, witnessing these mundane stories that we can really gain a sense of purpose and context. In Australia, um, where I'm speaking from, one in three households in Australia prefer animals over humans. And so our kingship model is, needs to be stretched to include that kind of more than human. And in this case, Zephyr. Zephyr's play on the devices became a key source of familiar jokes, play and connection. And here Zephyr's playing the, the, the Fiskers Game, game where you level up on the goldfish that you're catching. Anne, Steve and Melissa and grandfather Fred constantly shared stories about Zephyr. Zephyr and her antics became a way for them to keep in constant contact. Granddaughter Melissa sat with her father, grandfather Fred and taught him some basics on the media devices so that they could share those stories during the day. What could be seen as a kind of constant tethering of a care at distance. As a Croatian migrant, Fred had few family members in Australia apart from Anne, Steve and Melissa. During the pandemic, many families have seen the lockdown entail that we couldn't visit loved ones who are in aged care facilities. And so digital devices have become a crucial way to keep in touch. And so while Fred had, was taught by his um, granddaughter, Melissa, which is a, often a very familiar story, this does leave an important question. What happens for older adults who don't have the grandchildren to teach them? And how do they keep socially connected in a world in which digital inclusion equals social inclusion? When Polis explored the role of care at a distance in palliative telecare context, over a decade ago. She argued that technology only worked when in unison and not replacing face-to-face -face care. Polls argued against digital health pan panacea of technology as this kind of silver bullet, instead calling for a nuanced approach in which technology is grappling with the complexity of care. Her work was indeed prescient given the pandemic's recalibration towards telehealth. But care at a distance isn't just about formal health context. Rather, as a concept, it encapsulates mundane care as it often plays out in invisible and tacit ways. While the digital pivoting towards Zoomlandia has been discussed a lot during the pandemic, it is important to realise that some of us are not as lucky to pivot. Pivoting, in many cases, is associated with privilege. Indeed, field work by the ACAN Shaping um, Connections Group with the University of Third Age found a whole cohort of older adults who were unable to pivot to the digital and thus were socially excluded. The pandemic has highlighted a well-known adage, digital literacy 
directly aligns with social inclusion. And yet, even for those that could connect digitally, this sometimes actually amplified loneliness through a lack of physical connection. Some have been researching what has been called a kind of skin hunger phenomena in which the unevenness of its effects across cultural and social dimensions are palpable. Moreover, grief or what David Kessner has called un around social, around uncertain futures, um, from that to the imposed restrictions around funeral gatherings, has seen the limits of the digital in addressing cultural and material rituals around grieving. Zoomlandia cannot replace the intimacy of physical proximity. Take, for example, 75-year-old Danya from the Alone Together study led by Ruth De Silva. In this study conducted between August and November in 2020, interviews were conducted with culturally and linguistically diverse older adults living in Victoria. During the pandemic, Melbourne experienced six months of strict lockdown and curfews. And this project was guided by two questions during this time. How do older adults from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds connect with family, friends and services during periods of physical distancing and lockdowns? And how has technology helped or made connection, connecting more complicated? And so these findings were then illustrated, as you can see in the pictures here, by um, Sadvar Ahmed and published in The Guardian. So since retirement, 75-year-old Sri Lankan Dayini has been actively involved in an advocacy group and various cultural activities. She has no problem accessing health services. However, much, most of her important relationships um, and people that she cared about lived beyond the five kilometer radius permitted during the COVID lockdown. Moreover, Dania's um, brother died in July and it was devastating to only have 10 people at the funeral and to grieve at home without loved ones. As she asked, how do you mourn 70 years of a relationship by myself? Before the pandemic, Danyangi would see her family often and cook for them. Despite being apt with email and, so, and Zoom, the digital has been a poor substitute for her close-knit family. Her husband has offered to help her with the technology, but she would prefer to ask the grandchildren. As she notes, oh, it's, it is seriously miserable because it's all on the phone and I'm a people's person. I want to have them visit. I want to hold them. I want to hug them. I can't manage these phone conversations. They're terribly boring. My grandchildren call me on various things and they appear in the camera and they have different faces. So she's referring to like, you know, the kind of filters that they've come up with. But I can't cope with that because I don't know how to respond to those things. So I'm not a technologically savvy person. And they say, come into Zoom conversations. Come on on Zoom. Let's have a Zoom conversation. No, I'm just not happy at all. In the locating the mobile study, we found many forms of mundane care at a distance, especially as invisible informal care of older adults. Our study followed households in three diverse locations to gain a sense of cultural and linguistic differences and similarities with respect to intergenerational media usage. The little activities of checking in online, texting an instant message of care, sending a picture of co-presence all contributed to what could be understood as a corollary of care. In our book, Digital Media Practices in the Household, we talked about this how these mundane and quotidian forms of care at a distance were an essential part of digital kingship. So historically, kingship has played an important role in understanding relationships, power and context. Far from diminishing rituals, the digital amplifies particular rhythms and processes, especially in terms of ambient forms of care as an 
complex way of knowing the world that is both intimate and at a distance. In our field work, we found how families and in intimates could use data ambiently to keep a friendly eye on each other, a social dynamic form, a horizontal form of surveillance that was consensual and participatory. It's what myself and Ingrid Richardson have called careful surveillance, which I'll discuss in a moment. For anthropologists, kingship plays an important role in understanding society. It can help to curate the social relationships or patterns of sociality, providing a type of sense-making. However, just as contemporary forms of families have changed, so too has the composition of kingship. In particular, many kingship relations are shaped in and through digital media practice. For example, in Japan, the social media platform line is viewed as a way to curate kingship as a type of digital genealogy with family and friends. Although historically kingship and structures of the family life vary differently across co various cultures, increasing the, the role of migration, transnationalism and the digital are recalibrating kingship. So when we're talking about digital kingship in the book, we are kind of looking at these kind of new complex forms of family and what it means to be a family in the age of network media. And we very much draw on um, Lynn Schofield Clark's work, Heather Horse and Daniel Miller. And while kingship has been important in ethnographic understandings of culture, we argue that contemporary forms of kingship see it entangled, increasingly entangled in digital, social and material worlds. For sociologist Loretta Badezer, the exchange of emotional and moral support between transnational families staying in touch via digital media enacts a type of kinning. So drawing on Delado's um, notion of kin work, um, which recognizes the multiple forms invested in maintaining familial relationships, um, Badezer explores types of care ritual or routine as digital kinning. For her and her colleagues, digital kinging techniques for informal care are increasingly important when we're thinking about older adults. That is especially significant as populations of older adults increase and we want more to age in place, that is at home, in ways that involve little intervention. Indeed, the role of mobile media for social inclusion and informal care is crucial to these sustain to these kind of um, understandings of sustainable aging in place. So digital kingship also acknowledges that intimacy has always been mediated, if not by technologies, then by gestures, by memories, by cultural practice. Intimacy is a multi-layered culturally specific and contextual concept. Mobile intimacy, a term coined by myself and Sun Sun Lim, tried to reconcile some of these complexities around notions of mobility, not just technological mobility, but other actors on our sense of intimacy. And as we know, mobility always involves a paradox in mobility. So spearheaded by the important work of Berlant in terms of intimate publics, we argued that the role of mobile media further amplified inner subjectivities while conforming to existing social cultural rituals and practices. As one of the most intimate devices in everyday life and often viewed as an extension of our bodies and self, mobile phones are vehicles for haunting across multiple forms of material, symbolic and immaterial dimensions. They are vessels for and of our intimacies, our emotions, shaping and being shaped by the effective bonds. In work with Kate, Katie Kumsey into the role of mobile media in cross-cultural processes of loss and grief, we found that mobile media operated as both a witness and a companion in the transitional journey. They provide us a space for those continuing bonds to be enacted through the process of grief. They remind us, as psychologist David Kessner argues, that grief needs to be witnessed. This is a type of effective witnessing. The second concept is digital concept at uh, digital kingship as intergenerational care. 
In Western Melbourne, we find, we find Chinese Singaporean Nancy, who lives with her husband. Her 30-year-old daughter, Sophie, lives across the city up in the north. Nancy migrated to Australia 35 years ago. Much of her family still live in Singapore. For Nancy, the role of digital media is to provide different ways in which to convey emotion and care at a distance. And she really sees that that's been really helped through paralinguistics, such as stickers and emojis. In particular, WhatsApp has been a key platform both within her intimate family and members still living in Singapore. While WhatsApp is used for quick exchanges, they also use Skype and more recently things like Zoom in direct conversations and catch-ups. For Nancy and Sophie, Facebook um, Instant Messenger has been used as an easy way to keep in contact during the day. Frequent emojis give a sense of play, fun, and emotion. And while it was Sophie that taught Nancy new technological things such as stickers, um, they use them in quite different ways. Sophie, when we were interviewing, laughed fondly at her mum's overuse of stickers as a sign of her generation. Nancy saw emojis as a way of communicating intergenerationally, especially with her younger members of extended family. Emojis for Nancy are more familiar and colloquial. Through emojis, she could create a relationship that was more akin to a friendship rather than a strict auntie or niece, um, an auntie to her niece and nephew in Singapore. As Nancy notes, I love using the cute characters. They can express so much more than words. They express something more important, feelings. Literature on paralinguistics have highlighted their role in mundane forms of care and also emotional labor. While some critics have argued that digital platforms have commodified emotion in what um, Thomas Lemaire calls platformtivity, much joy and care can be found at the level of everyday. If we can take one positive element away from the pandemic, it has been the reminder of the fragility of humanity and the importance of care as a central tenant in the functioning of everyday life. Over the past decade, care has become an important space and concept, particularly for feminist researchers, such as Moll, um, Belakaska and Haraway. As an historically feminized concept, Care has many dimensions and effective modes of labor and pastoral care that has been historically devalued. But notions of care are used widely in diverse contexts, including parental practices, economic policy, social services, in terms of domestic labor and health work, in age facilities, and more broadly, in terms of caring for the more than human world in a time of the Anthropocene. Care is embedded in complex and contested relations and processes of world making. In prioritizing care as a crucial part of future making, we need more robust and complex ways to understand how mundane inter intergenerational care can play a significant role in digital kingship, especially in helping to maintain sustainable models for aging in place for older adults. For 84-year-old Gina, she arrived in Melbourne in 1952 from Italy with her husband and younger sister. They initially lived in a place called Paran, sharing a three-bedroom house with three other families. Gina's husband passed away a few years ago and her sister lives in a nursing home. With the pandemic restrictions, it made it impossible for Gina to visit her sister. Gina noticed on the phone calls that her sister's memory had, had started to go and that the, she thinks it was directly related to the lack of personal visits. For Gina, who has two adult children and a number of grandchildren and two great-grandchildren, the impact of not being able to physically see each other has really, for her, she describes it as leaving a kind of heavy feeling. Gina has a landline and often gets prank calls about her internet, but she doesn't have internet. She has the phone, the mobile phone, 
which, but she's not interested in using apps like FaceTime or taking photographs. She can read text messages from her grandchildren, but she refuses to reply. Gina's children stay in touch, but they, they have to stay away from actually physically seeing her um, because of the kind of um, issues around the pandemic. Gina continues to walk to the shops to help with her arthritis. She is missing the health benefits of her usual activities, and she feels that she's becoming old. But Gina continues to cook and garden, and others are impressed by her soil and her fat worms. But she misses being able to go out for lunch with other people. Um, and she's really worried about the fact that her great-grandchildren won't be able to recognise her. As she says, the great-grandson was three in April and the great-granddaughter, she is 15 months and she has, well, I haven't seen her for seven months. So she started walking and talking and because I don't, well, you know, my mobile phone is just for dialing a number, I can't see pictures of her. So I, I don't, I can't experience her walking and talking. I know they send things over Facebook and photos and things like that, but, you know, I can't use it. And, um, you know, I'm worried that they're not going to be able to recognise me. Care also involves a complexity of patience and watching. What scholars such as um, Alice um, Malvik have called social surveillance. This, this watching allows for ambient forms of care. Take, for example, Japanese daughter Rika and her mother Machiko. When we first meet 32 year old uh, flight attendant Rika, she lives alone in an apartment just a stone's throw away from her 72 year old mother Machiko. While traditionally families in Japan would live together, more recently, it's common for them to live apart. But it is the smartphone that has helped navigate a kind of care at a distance, that is allowing moments of ambient intimacy, co-presence and a friendly social surveillance. Rika, like many of her generation, grew up with the mobile phone or the Keitai. Her first Keitai was born when she was 10 as a form of personal security, a type of social surveillance response into what was happening in Japan at the time of a kind of growing um, aura of crime. And it became what Misha Matsuka called mum in the pocket. As, Keitai, as the Keitai has grown and transformed into the smartphone, so too have the digital rhythms of Rika and her mum's relationship involved in and through that digital co-presence. So while first generation Keitai was more about parents watching children in this kind of aura of crime, the smartphone has created different avenues for horizontal reciprocal social intergenerational watching. That is parents ambiently watching grandparents, parents watching children and so on. Digital media reflects the familiar notions of what in Japan is called, being called nima moro, that is a kind of, a kind of careful and social watching that cares about somebody's safety. For Rika, who often works overseas, the use of social media line helped her to keep a friendly eye on her elderly mother, which has been kind of crucial in that kind of care at a distance. And by the end of the field work, Rika has become a mother herself. Again, digital media has been recalibrated to reflect those familiar rhythms, that is the digital kingship. The use of media by families to watch carefully is shaped by many cultural and linguistic factors. For example, in Japan, after the disaster of the Fukushima um, nuclear reactor and the tsunami, et cetera, in 2011, known as 311, there's been a rapid rise of what has been called watching apps to allow families and loved ones to keep a, a kind of eye and keep track of each other in ways that are non-invasive, ambient and caring. Apps for watching older parents while they drive um, and to keep track of people with early uh, onset of dementia are indicative of these horizontal ways of watching. Within family and intimate relationships, 
Surveillance is taken many forms and often involves different textures of care. So recent social research literature into the datafication, that is digitalized information about people using digital devices and software and data valence using, that is the using of information to watch and observe people have often portrayed these processes as exploitative, manipulative, controlling and constraining of human agencies. And we've seen many examples where it has been used in corrupt ways. This body, but however, this body of research has failed to acknowledge how datafication and data valence can also be consensual, creative, empowering and participatory in many people's everyday lives. So while debates about data valence in locations such as China and more recently Hong Kong, as we've seen, um, have very real dark dimensions about governmental control, in Japan we see uh, examples of data valence which can be conceptualized more as caring. Often data datafication is conflated with data valence, that is the watching of people through data. These processes um, can be seen um, and, and as I've looked at with um, in collaboration with Deborah Lupton who's done a lot of work in this area, datafication and data valence are, can be used in many ways which are creative and participatory. So rather than just thinking about them to exploit, I would say that maybe we can also think about them to care. This vignette about Rika and her mother illustrates what I have been calling a kind of friendly social surveillance. That is an understanding of surveillance that involves a sense of care and an ethics of care. Rather than top-down models of data valence that receive high levels of attention in internet studies and surveillance studies, digital technology directed at supporting and facilitating care are often used in participatory ways in intimate relationships. Data valence and datafication technologies can offer opportunities for people to engage in practices that will improve health and well-being important as we move towards societies with increasingly aging populations. These digitalized forms of communication allow for generating mediated co-presence and maintaining intimate familial connections in the face of geographic separation. Further, they can help people engage in self-care when family members are not physically present. For put de la Bella Casa, caring is fundamentally relational. That is, drawing on Haraway, she sees ontologies of care as being becoming with. Care is often, is always involved in different gradations of power and watching, which are relationally managed. The term careful surveillance, which was coined by myself and Ingrid Richardson, has, was originally used to kind of address some of the kind of complexities between human and companion animals and technology. And in that kind of context, we talked about surveillance as something that must be a careful practice in terms of its effects on both humans and animals. In further research, this notion has been used to, um, to be expanded to think about the complex and uneven ways in which humans navigate formal and informal surveillance carefully as a way of thinking through an ethics of care. In this broader context, careful surveillance describes the way in which we monitor and watch our intimates as cohabitants subject to our care. Yet it also deliberately implies that surveillance should be a careful practice, one that we consider very carefully in terms of its implication on others. So this is but one area of research um, that we could really be thinking about in terms of taking this pandemic and kind of taking some kind of learnings from this pandemic in terms of the opportunity and challenges and how we might work together to create a more careful and thoughtful new normal that acknowledges the significance and unevenness of digital kingship in our everyday lives and how these quotidian intergenerational practices might participate in our changing and yet continuing notions of care within a datafied world. So during the pandemic, 
it's thesis and spelling. During the pandemic, we have all witnessed firsthand the unevenness of digital media inter literacy and its impact on social inclusion, especially for adults. While older adults um, that had children or grandchildren experienced new technology uptake, such as um, social media and Zooming and even video games, there has been a, a, a quite a few who have been left behind. So as we move forward to learn from the pandemic, if we are to create sustainable futures, we do need more complex articulation of those informal practices in and around digital media. Studying the relationship between care, data and ageing in place requires a new type of careful ethics that understands that the digital is implicated unevenly in our everyday lives. These inequalities equate to social exclusion, which in turn impact on our well-being. I have presented a few concepts around digital kingship born from ethnographic fieldwork to provide some ways in which we might curate our understandings of informal care, care at a distance and intergenerational care that acknowledges the messiness and complexity of digital, social and material worlds. I've presented some projects that have prioritized the role of creative forms of research translation to engage general publics into a call for action and social change. In this talk, I pose that we need to learn from the lived experiences and to give voice to the invisible forms of care involved in digital media so that we can move forward for sustainable and careful futures. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Larissa, for your insightful um, keynote and addressing in, on so many levels and, and bringing to us so many different cases and, and, and diverse contexts uh, and, and, of course, addressing the importance of, of focusing on the, the mundane practices and a building of, uh, of informal digital literacies to better understand uh, and conceptualize care. And, um, and, and I was, uh, we have, I will definitely now um, bring some of the questions that have, uh, that have, that are coming from the audience. But uh, prior to that, um, while, uh, well, among so many interesting insights that you have brought, I was wondering about the question concerning digital inequalities, in particular because these issues, as you, as we all know, and you've been, uh, all, yeah, uh, precisely, uh, you have addressed that during your talk. Um, the 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 question concerning digital inequalities and family communication at a distance, especially with the pandemic now. Um, I was I was just wondering how um, do digital inequalities. Um, in a context of your work, but also throughout uh, the different uh, locations you have conducted field work, uh, how do digital inequalities shape the building or are shaping the building of intergeneration digital literacies and understandings of care from a distance? Mm -hmm. Because these questions are amplified and, and we know that the the inequalities in terms of access, but also in terms of, of inequalities, and you addressed that very well when you uh, when you mentioned about the, the power relations within the family, uh, some of your participants uh, being um, embarrassed or or feeling shameful about asking for uh, for for help when it comes to accessing certain tools. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering more generally, how do you uh, do you see that? How do you see digital inequalities? shaping mm. of, of, of care and, and this and the digital literacies in a pandemic. Thank you. That's a wonderful question. Wow. <laughs> I think that's my life project actually. <laughs> it's just, um, yeah, I mean it's been interesting. Um, I, I've done some, I suppose I think a, a lot of people have done some rethinking of what their academic practice means during a pandemic and the what you can bring what tools that can bring to help people um, and I think one of the things so previously in my research it has um, I suppose I have 
emphasise more the um, intergenerational learnings and literacies and, and more of the kind of positive dimensions. Um, and but during the pandemic, it really became very clear the, um, as I said, the, the inequalities being amplified. And um, it has made me more interested as a researcher to think about not just doing the ethnography, but then what happens to the ethnography afterwards and how we can think about research in terms of impact. So I think that one of the things that um, I was showing with the two projects alone together and the ACAN Shaping Technology, the Shaping Connections project, was that they have the ethnographic component, but then they also have the, um, how do we communicate this to the public to actually enact social change? And I think this is really a really important part of, it doesn't just stop at the ethnography. The ethnography tells you the understanding and then from the understanding there, there's a really important, um, as a researcher, I think there's an imperative to, to act on this and to, to try and um, change things. So. I mean, a couple of years ago, I, if you'd said, you know, policy, I was like, oh, policy, you know, that's that's for the policy heads. But more and more, um, particularly around digital literacy, I am listening more and more to my colleagues who do a lot of work around um, digital literacy to kind of think about, um, you know, changing the politicians and, and kind of changing the way that, um, you know, we, we get telecommunication regulation, et cetera. So I'm thinking about a colleague of mine in Canada, um, Kim Sorchek, who's done some amazing work where she's worked with older adults, um, finding out some of the barriers to uptake of technology. And a lot of them are psychological barriers, not just physical. Sometimes they can be physical, like arthritis or whatever, but um, often they are psychological. And it's those perceptions that um, we really need to be thinking about what are those risk perceptions and how can we work together to help them to overcome that. And she's actually um, then went along to the telecommunication company and actually got um, things changed so that they would be thinking about the older adults and what were some of the concerns there. And I think that's the thing that as the digital has become kind of all pervasive, it has been so uneven and now it's um, you know our duty of care to actually think about how we highlight these inequalities and then act on it to enact change. I hope that answered her or maybe that went off on a different pathway. <laughs> Sorry. I have uh, some, absolutely, thank you very much. I have some very interesting questions from the audience. Uh, the first question comes from uh, Raleen Wilden. Uh, she is your colleague uh, from Melbourne. Raleen from La Trobe University. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, she okay. says, I was hoping you could say a bit more about digital kinship as going beyond the human. In our mm. research, we have been struck by the intimate relations that people develop with their devices and the platforms they use for yeah. digital kinning. Have you noticed any evidence of digital devices and platforms not just being used to digitally connect with kin, but also becoming perceived in some ways as kin, as mem for instance, as members of uh, the kinship network? That's a really great question. Wow, that's just opened up another Pandora's box. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think the the fact that mobile technologies have really taken personification to a new level. Um, it it it. It was really, when I first started looking at mobiles two decades ago, I was really interested in how people made mobiles, like how they customised the outside of the phone um, as an extension of their personalities. And so the phone became this kind of physical um, extension. Um, and it's been interesting because as the phones have become more and more complex internally and much more kind of digitally um, multimedia, um, how that is really um, further enacted types of um, really quite complex relationships with, with um, the objects. And in my work with um, Katie Kumsi, where we were looking at um, mobiles as both the witness and companions to grief, we often found that people would um, so when we when we were doing interviews after the Fukushima disaster, um, you know, I had some um, participants who would talk about they were cradling the phone as if it was actually their family inside the phone. 
So it actually became this really, really powerful. And they couldn't connect because networks went down, but they still held the phone as if holding that could hold onto their family. And, and that, that kind of feeling, um, that kind of complex feeling of intimacy, um, I don't think that, that, I mean, I think that needs a, um, a lot of attention and actually needs to be taken quite seriously um, as a kind of companion, as it can kind of, um, and as, it, as a kind of, also we looked at the phone as this part of the continuing bond. So when people passed away, they often text loved ones who had passed away. And when we interviewed them, we said, well, but did you actually think that they were still, that they could still respond, respond during the, you know, to the phone? And, and like, well, I don't know. I, I seem to think that I remember, like we had one participant who actually said that she could remember getting text messages from her best friend who'd passed away. And she said afterwards, she rationalized it and she realized that she couldn't have been, but it felt like that. And I, I think the, the kind of, we can't um, underestimate the power of perceptions and the importance of perceptions in, in that process. So, but yeah, that's a fantastic question. I, I think there's another whole talk I'd love like to hear. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> That's a, that's a very interesting point because we also had another question from the audience from Ping Ping Nigawing, uh, in which she uh, uh, was asking you whether the, the notion of digital kinship also uh, can be framed in relation to digital devices and uh, mm. how do you actually uh, define digital kinship? Uh, yeah, in particular, the way you just described, how, what is the role uh, of yeah. uh, the digital device itself. Um, yeah. So in a way, I believe it has been answered. Uh, so I will proceed with the next question. And we have a lot of wonderful comments uh, praising your yeah. intervention, your <laughs> keynote lecture, and very insightful, uh, wonderful. And, and the next question is from Isabella D'Angelo. Uh, Isabella is a PhD student from the University of Bologna. She asks, how does digital kinship relate to and affect the oppression of women in the household. Oh, wow. That's a great one. <laughs> That's a fantastic one. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, I did do a short study. I mean, I mentioned um, uh, Misha Matsuka's work in Japan, and she did some really wonderful stuff around the mobile phone being mum in the pocket and how rather than actually freeing mothers up, it actually made for more micro-coordination and more emotional labour. Um, and I think that is really... Um, that, that can be found in many different cultures. Um, I mean, in different cultures, it, is, uh, it manifests um, in various ways, but it has definitely for women, and I think um, I was just thinking about Melissa Gregg's work, um, the book that she wrote in 2011, Works Intimacy, where she talked about, she interviewed uh, creative practitioners and um, people working in the creative industries and how, you know, they were using mobile technologies and that, that was kind of part of their precarious labour and it was actually freeing them up to be, you know, wherever they want to be, but it actually meant that they were, it's that kind of um, double-edged sword where it's actually, it's a leash. So you're free all the time, but you're actually on a leash all the time as well. And I, this has come up, it, the, the, the gender dimensions of um, work and the mother, daughter, son, et cetera, dimensions. Um, you know, there's been some wonderful work. I mean, um, the parent app book by um, Lynn Sheffield Clark was a wonderful example of talking about some of those kind of complexities around the emotional labor. And um, yeah, I think it just gets more and more. <laughs> so thank you for that question. That's a, that's a wonderful question and, and, and very important, yeah. Larissa, continuing um, in this line of the paradoxical uh, relations mm. and also some addressing some of the paradoxes that you uh, uh, brilliantly walked us through during your talk. Uh, the next question comes from um, Miriam uh, Tweet. Um, Miriam, uh, she, 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 she says that there's so much to think with and think about, uh, especially the notion of careful surveillance Mm. Uh, so, uh, so Miriam was wondering if you could expand a bit more on how that works out in practice and relationships, mm. for instance, in regard to the women involved in gardening who only had a landline and was afraid of her grand, uh, great grandchildren. 
would mm -hmm. not recognize her. Yeah, one of the um, stories that you shared during your presentation. So she mm -hmm. asked, did, for instance, her children or grandchildren then print out pictures for her or responded in another way to ensure that their older relative, relative would still be somehow included. Mm. Um, uh, just to uh, present Miriam, Miriam tweaked, she's a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Oslo. And she okay. works on how the mediated everyday experiences with refugee households um, uh, takes place in the Middle East. Wow, wonderful. Um, well, I'd love, to I'd love to read some of her research. So, um, um, yes, so in the case of, um, yes, um, with, with the uh, Alone Together study, which was, um, and I should mention that that was um, led by um, Ruth De Silva, and, um, and it was a whole group of researchers um, involved, in, including um, lived, people with lived experience in terms of carers. Um, and um, yes, there were various different uh, techniques that involved material techniques to kind of work around the digital. Um, like, so that I think in the case of um, the example I gave, I think they did actually print out some pictures um, and left them in the letter box. Because one of the things that happened in Melbourne was that um, with older adults being, you know, getting um, the, the virus so badly, um, it was really important that people not um, have face-to-face -face contact with them because of the kind of, um, you know, not infecting them basically, because, you know, supposedly young people can carry it and not, and have a asymptomatic um, symptoms. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think there were workarounds in terms of material ones. And, but I think that the fact that she could talk about, you know, that she knew stuff was happening on Facebook. And, and this is where the perceptions of risk are really interesting. So why was it, what, what was kind of being the, what was the barrier for her in terms of not taking up the technology, even though she knew that she was missing out on some of that contact. And I think that's really interesting, that kind of, um, the difference between the perceptions and the practice and why sometimes there's a kind of disconnect there. Um, in terms of the uh, careful surveillance, um, I, when Ingrid and I were coining the term, we were trying to um, embody the paradox that we thought when we think about like the kind of informal surveillance that was happening in um, the field work. And um, it was really about trying to bring, you know, like we really wanted to bring care to surveillance because we think that often surveillance um, in the kind of informal examples that we were finding, um, you know, care was a really big motivator. Care was really about the, the practices that were, um, it was the motivation, it was the practices, but it was also the kind of ethics that was happening there. And so we were trying to um, put what seems like a kind of, uh, I suppose, an oxymoronic kind of um, concept, but actually saying that, no, it's actually a tautology. You know, surveillance needs to be careful. And that's where, you know, um, a lot of the literature, you know, particularly around the government surveillance and the kind of older models of surveillance have seen a very, very kind of hierarchical. And I'm not saying that those power relationships don't exist, but what we were finding with families was that often the ambient sensing watching was more about trying to, particularly in the case of older adults, give autonomy and dignity um, in their lives, which was really kind of crucial because when people start to feel fragility, it's really important that they are given, you know, kind of the apparatus to support them on that journey and not feeling like then fragility equals lack of independence, etc. So um, particularly in the Japanese example, the fact that they did have apps which were focused on dementia and things like that you know at first we were like whoa that's really that's that's kind of creepy but then when we actually talked to people how they were used we realized it wasn't creepy it was actually trying to just um, find non-invasive ways of caring for family in ways that could empower people so but yeah it is I think it's a crucial kind of it is a constant tension that we should be um, constantly thinking about yeah Thank you, Larissa. I, I think we are reaching already the end of, uh, of our session. There are still so many more questions. I have, uh, unfortunately, I have skipped 
not on a purpose, some of the questions. Um, uh, maybe if there is uh, room for just one more from Catherine Pipe, uh, she's associate professor in Love University. She asks very briefly, she thanks for your wonderful talk. And uh, she was wondering about the notion of digital kinship. What is peculiar? What is new about that? And how does mm -hmm. digital kinship differ from digitally mediated kinship? Mm. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a, that's a really good question. How would it be different than digitally mediated? I mean, I think the thing, I suppose, um, I perhaps that the term doesn't have mediation in there because um, kingship is really about um, mapping intimacies um, in a way to make kind of sense of it and um, and about the patterns of relationships that we have. And I think the thing about if we were to put like digital mediation, it would suggest that the digital is mediating whereas other things haven't mediated. And I think the point that I was making earlier was that we, we, we really need to, in kingship, the, we need to interrogate the idea that intimacy, that you can have a pure intimacy, that somehow face-to-face -face intimacy isn't mediated. And of course it is, it's mediated by, our language, our gestures, memory, et cetera. And so um, I think that's the digital is, is about kind of acknowledge the digital kingship rather than digitally mediated kingship is really about acknowledging that kind of tension around how we define intimacy and how intimacy plays out as a kind of um, a cultural lens or a lens to understand cultural practice. Thank you very much, Larissa, for, uh, for your you. wonderful you. talk. Uh, and uh, I, I would like to, uh, to announce that, of course, we still have 10 minutes uh, before the next round, the second round of panel sessions. And uh, one more time, wonderful to meet you here. And oh, thank, you. thank you. Learn a lot more about your work. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda, maybe Thank you we want much. to show the visual that uh, Renee asked. Oh, yes, the visual. I want the visual. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so Renee's much. been busy working. Yeah. I'm, st I'm still working, but I'm uh, okay with sharing a work in progress. If I'm allowed to share the screen, yes, I am. Okay. Can you see my sketch? Yes, okay. So uh, one thing you talked about was like what you mentioned a few times was uh, the collaborate of the yeah. uh, fact that digital illiteracy and social exclusion really are uh, interlinked with each other. And I really see that in my personal um, network as well. And uh, I like the idea of the phone as vessel of in intimacy. So I'm working with that to show the love <laughs> <laughs> and I will uh, work on that for a bit more and then the organization will share it with you all. I love the uh, the um, corona um, <laughs> slide thing. I'm not sure <laughs> how it's called in English but it's the seesaw, seesaw. Seesaw, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so enjoy the next uh, panel sessions and the entire afternoon of very insightful and, and amazing discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Larissa. <laughs> <laughs>